good morning, everyone. It's good to be back. I enjoyed my time in Fargo. I was reminded a little bit about what North Dakota nice really is. And if you don't get that joke, I can explain it later because it's not very nice, actually. But um, I am glad to be back. I, uh, people have asked how my trip was, and I have to say when... Uh, when I left last Sunday to start heading home, uh, I was listening to one of the local radio stations and the weather forecast came on and they said, rain today with a chance of light snow mixing in tonight. And I hit my cruise a couple notches up at that point because I need to get south. But most of you guys know I'm a bit of a history nut and I wanted to share a, <clears throat> share a story with you guys today that you may not be familiar with. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with the tragedy of the Titanic. Um, what most people don't know is that there's actually a, another tragedy that took place in addition to the terrible loss of life. Um, but in the early 20th century, the country of Mexico was the greatest consumer per capita of mayonnaise in the world. Mexico didn't have the natural resources to produce their own mayonnaise, so they had to import everything, which is kind of interesting. And apparently on the Titanic, they were getting their greatest shipment of mayonnaise that they'd ever had from Great Britain. Well, of course, we know the story of the Titanic that struck an iceberg, went down in the North Atlantic in 1912. Terrible loss of life. And in 1912, the, the news didn't travel quite as quickly as it does today, so it took a little bit of time for the message to get to Mexico about this terrible tragedy. And when it did finally reach Mexico, uh, the Mexican president at the time, Francisco Madero, declared a day of mourning, and it's, it's still a national holiday today. Uh, we celebrate it today. You know it as Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> I get to tell that joke on May 5th, like once every six years at best. So look at the calendar. And just beware, in like six or seven years, you'll have to be rid of me if you don't want to hear that joke again. I'm sorry, I'll show myself out. As we come into the sermon today, though, I do want you to think about something. And I'm going to ask this question a little bit later. And, and don't answer it out loud yet. Just think about this for a moment. I want you to think about this question. What is the most dangerous word for a Christian to use? Just think about this for a little bit as, as we go into this message. What is the most dangerous word for a Christian to use? We've talked about a lot of things so far in our Faith 101 series. We've talked about this idea that, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've talked about how the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. We've talked about how Christ died for sinners and that we are all sinners. Remember that? We mentioned that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Remember that God is for us. And if God is for us, who or what can possibly be against us? We've talked a lot about how are we saved. We talked about that a few weeks ago. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We talk, about, we talk a lot about when we're saved, this, this transformation that takes place in us. When we, we surrender ourselves to Jesus, we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And, and by saying we accept Jesus as our Savior, meaning we understand and accept this teaching that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Messiah. The focus we put is, is so much on this heart change that takes place. How we have changed from this person that, that really is against God, that opposes who God is and what God calls on his people to do. We've changed from someone that is against God, that is anti-Christ. And I say anti-Christ, not in the modern day end times idea of the anti-Christ, but someone that opposes God, someone that opposes Christ. Anti-God is anti-Christ. One person might not be openly hostile toward God, but they're not necessarily a follower either. And so we go from that state where we're against God 
And this change takes place within us. And we become someone that now lives for God, for Christ. We are pro-God, pro-Christ, no longer anti-God or anti-Christ. That change is a result of us believing in Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit. Remember, when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we also receive the Holy Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And then it's God the Holy Spirit who is living within us that enables us to do some things. Each of us, when we accept Jesus, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we also receive certain spiritual gifts that when we do as we're gifted, we all work together to accomplish the work of the church. In a few weeks, we're going to spend some time uh, talking a lot about spiritual gifts. And we're going to give everybody here an opportunity to learn what your gifts are and how you can use them for the benefit of the church. And I don't just mean the local church. I don't just mean FBC Hiawatha. But I mean the church, the global church. You might remember a few weeks ago we did a a demonstration. We used a balloon to show a little bit on how the Holy Spirit works. And if you were here, we had that balloon and we stuck it in a big bucket of icy cold water. And that balloon, even though it didn't, it didn't lose air, it didn't change how much air was actually in there, what happened to the balloon in that icy cold water? It shrunk, right? So we showed how that outside influence of the cold shrunk the Holy Spirit, or shrunk that balloon, just like outside influences in our life can shrink the influence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. If we would have used a hot air dryer, a hair dryer on that, what would have happened to the balloon? It would have expanded. I kind of gave the, the answer away there, didn't I? It would have expanded, eventually maybe popping. Holy Spirit doesn't pop, fortunately, for us. But it shows how those, those outside influences, what we do in our life, can, influence, can, can affect how much the Holy Spirit is going to influence us if we allow that to happen or if we don't allow that to happen. And I want you to keep that in mind, that that Holy Spirit experiment in mind, as we continue with our sermon today. Our reading today was just two verses, and honestly, I'm going to kind of focus on one of those verses, and really just the first half of one of those verses. So Romans 12, 2, the first part of 12, 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In recapping everything we talked about so far, uh, just a little bit ago that I did, I pray you recognize much of what we talk about is a transformation of our heart or our soul. And in accepting Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, our soul is transformed from that path that leads to eternal death, and it transforms to a path that leads to eternal life. Our heart is moved from darkness into light. And then our life, the conscious life we live, it's no longer there to serve self, it's there now to serve God. One of the big things that we got to remember is when we become a Christ follower, we don't just sit on our hands waiting to die to realize how good God is. At least that's not what we're supposed to do, right? Once we come to know Jesus, once we have the Holy Spirit in us, we have a job to do here on earth as well. So it's right for us to talk about the transformation of our soul, but Paul here says we are supposed to be transformed by the renewal of our mind as well. I tell you all this stuff about Jesus, I can say all of these things to a non-believer, and every person must decide whether this Jesus stuff is true. As I've said before, I believe in free will. I believe we can say yes to God. I believe we can say no to God. So if I talk to somebody and I I tell a person about Jesus and I say, well, you can be free in Jesus Christ. You can be saved in Jesus Christ. You can have eternal life in Jesus Christ. That's just me talking about that. Then God, that still small voice of God, starts to stir 
in them. It moves in their heart. God speaks to them. And then it's up to that, per that person to decide whether or not all of this Jesus stuff is true. They have that moment where they get to say yes to God or they get to say no God. So when we become a believer, do we stop having that decision-making? Do, do we get to a point then, by default, as people living with God the Holy Spirit in us, do then we always say yes to God? Do we always do what God wants and needs us to do? Anybody? Of course not. Am I cutting out? Pretty bad? Do I need new batteries? I don't know what's going on. Should I switch mics? Okay. <laughs> I'll do anything to make the sermon last longer. So, it's just... You guys want to hear a story about the Titanic? No. So we become a believer in Jesus Christ. We've said yes to Jesus once, but we're still human, right? We still have this, this opportunity when God says, hey, I need you to do this, a lot of times we're going to say no, aren't we? Now, it might not always be a conscious thing that we do, but we do say no to God quite frequently. Again, Paul here in Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The world. The world meaning the things that are not of God. The world is a really strong influence on us. I think most of us would recognize this basic fact that the world has a strong influence on us. But it's much harder to recognize the specifics of what's a worldly influence on us and what's a godly influence on us. We're brought up in a society, and society tells us what is right and what is wrong. But are those rights and wrongs always the same as godly rights and wrongs? There is a section in the New Testament that gives a lot of really great examples of how to act in a godly way, in a way that is not worldly. And the things it suggests are absolutely rejected by the world. And frankly, they sound a little crazy if we're focused more on the world than we are on Jesus. Anybody have an idea what section I might be talking about? I'm talking about the Sermon on the Mount from chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew's Gospel. What are some of these things that Jesus commands us to do in the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus says, love your enemies. Jesus says, do not resist an evil person. He says, if someone tries to steal from you, let them. He says, if someone asks you for something, give it to them. He says, don't worry about the behavior of other people. Worry about your own behavior." He says, forget about accumulating wealth. Now, does the world teach any of this stuff? Love your enemies. How can you kill someone if you honestly love them? How can you kill your enemies if you love them? Do not resist an evil person. I have a right to defend myself. If someone tries to steal from me, let them. But I work hard for what I have. I can't just let someone take it from me. Give money to that person begging on the street corner. Why? They can get a job. Worry about my own behavior and not other people? Come on. My way of thinking is clearly the right way of thinking. And that obnoxious kid running around the restaurant really needs to be taught a lesson. Forget about accumulating wealth. What do you mean? That's the American dream. I asked you earlier, what is the most dangerous word for a Christian to use? The most dangerous word for a Christian to use. Anybody thought of what that might be? That anyone wants to share? Share. 
hate, can't, no, what, me, some of these are really dangerous words, but I'm going to say the most dangerous word is this, it's a three letter word, but, B-U-T, but, but is the most dangerous word a Christian can use, depending on the context, of course, how? It's used in this dangerous way. I know I'm a Christian, but... I know Jesus says to do this, but... I know I shouldn't do that, but... You ever caught yourself saying that? I'm not talking about situations where we simply sin. Sin is in all of our lives. It's going to happen none of us will ever fully live up to what God needs us to do. Remember, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The but moments I'm talking about, though, these are the moments when we know the right thing to do and we flat out refuse to do it. The biggest problem with this word and this phrase says we know the right thing to do, but we make a conscious decision not to do it. I know I'm supposed to feed that hungry person over there, but I won't do it. It's their own fault they're hungry. I know Jesus says I'm supposed to love this person, but I'm not going to. They're Russian or Ukrainian. They're Palestinian or Israeli or whoever the world says our enemy is supposed to be right now. And this is where transforming our mind becomes so incredibly important. Being renewed by the transforming of our mind. Our heart has been transformed. Our soul has been transformed from a dying thing to a living thing, to the one that will be with God forever. But that doesn't instantly wipe away the influence the world has on our brains. Our minds do not immediately go from being of the world and being influenced by the world to being of God and following what God needs us to do. So what do we do? First, if you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, make today the day you say yes and accept Him. Make the declaration. Say it out loud. Say that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised Him from the dead. Believe that today and be saved. Next, if you are or once you are a believer, start to identify how much of your understanding is worldly and how much is actually godly. This is naturally a lot easier said than done. I think I brought this up one other time a few months ago. And I want to encourage you to do this, as hard as it is. And if you do this, expect answers, expect results. But if you do this, make sure you're ready for it. Honestly, if you're ready for it, honestly go to God in prayer and ask Him, God, am I right? God, am I right? Because I can tell you a lot of the answers you're going to get from God are no, you're not. A few of them are going to be, hey, yeah, you got this part right, but we got some other things to work on. God, am I right? What else can we do to become more God-focused than world-focused, more God-centered than world-centered? Well, we can start by immersing ourselves in God's Word. You can read your Bible. Read those areas that seem really crazy to you. All those those parts of the, the Sermon on the Mount that sound like talking points that you don't really like? Let's listen to those and see if Jesus really means what Jesus says. Read your Bible. Read read all those love your enemy parts. I would encourage you too to find a devotional to read every day or as often as you can. You can do this on your app. You can download different devotionals on your phone. We've been trying really hard to get more copies of Our Daily Bread for you to bring home. That's 
that's been an office frustration that we, we don't have to get into this morning. But we're trying to get those if you prefer to have a hard copy of a devotional. There are countless classic devotionals out there too that you can find that will help you grow closer to Jesus. You can add all of that on top of being with a group of fellow Christians who they're looking to grow. They themselves want to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. You can get together with them, challenge one another, support one another, ask the hard questions, and look to God for those answers. And perhaps most importantly, if you haven't done so yet, admit to yourself, it's the hardest thing for most of us to do, admit to yourself, you know what? Maybe I'm not right about everything. Is that hard for anybody else to say that? Or is that just me? Maybe I'm not right about everything. Ask, like I said, ask God to show you those areas you're right, those areas that you need to learn, where you need to change, where you need to become more Christ-like. Try to recognize the moments when you're about to make a worldly decision as opposed to a godly decision. Recognize that but moment. I know I'm a Christian, but wait a second. I know the right thing to do. So instead of saying I'm not going to do it, maybe I should do it. Pause. Figure out what Jesus would want you to do in that situation. Perhaps most importantly, I want you to remember this transformation is a process. It doesn't happen instantly. Your salvation is that instant moment. When you say yes to Jesus, you are saved. Congratulations, that's wonderful. We can start to live our life for Christ. But this transformation process takes time. That's the growth that we talk about. But can you imagine, can you imagine the change that will take place in our life, in our families, in our community, in our church, if we all could no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but we are all transformed by the renewing of our minds. God, am I right? It's the hardest question you'll ever ask of God, but it's probably the most important.